Hi, I'm Jonathan Jones, and I'll be talking with you today about some research I conducted over the last several years. Thanks for attending. This presentation is about perceiving sounds in a second language. I say second language, but it's really any language other than the one you were raised speaking. So we'll be looking at how we test second language vowel perception and how we can better inform our designs. Briefly, I'll be giving you some background to establish why this work is relevant. Then I'll talk about two studies, their key findings, and what we can take away from them. There are many considerations for speech perception, but this presentation is about segmentals, and more specifically, vowels. But what makes them so important? Vowels have a high functional load, and that's just another way of saying that they play an important role in differentiating between two or more words, and they do so with great frequency. If you have trouble differentiating between certain vowels, as many second language speakers do, then things can get a little bit more complicated than they otherwise would be. Think of homophones in your first language, words that sound the same but represent different things, like peak, P-E-E-K, and peak, P-E-A-K. Now, if you have a hard time differentiating between the high E and slightly lower I, you've added to your list of homophonous words. So you hear pick, P-I-C-K, the same as peak and peak. So there's a compound effect in play, and compounding is a feature we find in sounds that have high functional load. During and Monroe have done some work on this that's, wor that's worth checking out. Of course, context and grammar help disambiguate things, but it isn't always so simple. In London, for instance, where this research took place, many street names and locations are separated by a single vowel. There are so many streets that it's hard to keep an inventory. Redcliffe Square, R-E-D, and Radcliffe Square, R-A-D, is an example. If you don't know that there's another street that sounds the same, and there's no reason to doubt whether you've heard the person that you're speaking with properly, or for them to doubt you, you may readily go to the wrong place. Now you could say, oh, easy, just write it down. And of course, that's ideal, but we don't live in an ideal world, and a lot of our information is communicated orally. Add the time pressures and high stakes uh, to certain environments, and the problem becomes, well, more problematic. So how do we get from a systematic mishearing of vowels to successful communication? One promising approach that has a growing body of research behind it is high variability phonetic training, HVPT. And this is where we zero in on our gap. HVPT concentrates exposure to target speech sounds by providing multiple recordings from multiple talkers. For instance, instead of hearing one person say bet, you'll hear several people saying it. Oftentimes, the listening materials are constrained to isolated words and syllables, such as B, vowel, T. So things like bet, boot, beat, etc. It could also be be, ba, bada, simple things like this. No context, just sounds. Now, there are a few reasons for limiting the context to isolated words and syllables, but historically, it has been to control for confounding variables, what you might call construct irrelevant variants. Vowels are variable in nature, and they include spectral variants within them. They're susceptible to change based on their neighboring sounds. So a ah in isolation is spectrally different than a ah in cat, which would be different than a ah in John's cat's cue. Including the variation from things like linking sounds, word stress, sentence stress, and the like would be difficult, if not impossible, to control for. So researchers have shied away from such variability because they want nice, clean results. Of course, the flip side of controlling for construct irrelevant variants is that you might end up with something that works in the lab, but not actually reflect real life performance. Focusing back on high variability phonetic training, this need for clean results shouldn't be nearly as important. After all, variability is the mandate for training. An argument can be made that isolating sounds allows people to attend to them better. And this would be fine, except there is little published work 
that compares perception with isolated words and syllables to perception with sentences. HVPT is intended to be a practical means of actually helping people improve. But how well do our instruments allow us to make claims about improvement? Does telling the difference between bet and bat, so B-E-T and B-A-T, indicate that you can tell the difference between expensive X-P-E and expansive X-P-A? Or are we using these isolated syllables and words at the expense of generalizability? Now I'll briefly go over the first study. Study 1 investigated the effects of employing more phonologically and sententially diverse listening materials to test L2 vowel perception. I hypothesized that restrictive environments would inflate scores and provide an incomplete picture of learners' skill sets, thus limiting generalizability. The aim was to explore the extent to which sentences could provide viable testing materials. The primary research question was, what are the measurable effects of employing diverse listening materials in testing vowel perception for L2 learners? This was primarily a quantitative study, but included an open-ended question at the end, asking participants about their experience with the tasks. I won't have time for the qualitative element in this presentation, but please ask questions at the end if you're interested. Study 1 included 31 Mandarin speakers with 5 control. The control performed at ceiling levels throughout. So results here will focus on the Mandarin group. Just know that the expected performance of someone who can tell the difference between the study's target vowels is at or near 100%. So a bit on the Mandarin group. It was chosen because Mandarin is well documented as having a hard time differentiating between the English front vowels e i and e a. For reference, this is explained by Flegge's speech learning model and Best and Tyler's perceptual assimilation model for L2 learners, so PAM L2. Mandarin has relatively few vowels, and the target vowels in this experiment are not contrastive in Mandarin. The front English vowels overlap with Mandarin vowels, and due to the similarity, it is challenging to discriminate between the target vowel pairs. The L2 sample here was an advanced cohort of English language speakers with an average IELTS score of 7.4 overall and 8.1 for listening. A mixture of monosyllabic and disyllabic words was employed across the various types of listening materials. Note that there were four main kinds of stimuli. B vowel T, diverse words, directions, and diverse sentences. B vowel T included beat, bit, bet, bat. Diverse words were any word other than B-vowel-T. These are things like meals, mills, betting, batting, these kinds of things. Directions was essentially a fixed frame for sentences. So the sentences began with meet me at as the carrier phrase, and then the participants had to listen for the location. There were two blocks of discrimination tasks, and four blocks of identification tasks. Two vowel pairs, e, i, and e, a, were concurrently included in each block. For discrimination, listeners heard four vowels and had to choose the odd one out. For identification, listeners chose from two options which word they heard in the audio. The experiment consisted of 552 items across the six blocks of tasks and took between 60 and 90 minutes to complete. For analysis, I compared measurable effects of using different prompt types using Cronbach's alpha, percent correct, and generalized linear mix modeling. I also looked at listener experience as noted, but again, we'll be leaving that out for today. The experiment was exploratory, and it wasn't even known whether we get reliable results using sentences, so the first step was to look at internal consistency to see how well connected speech held up. Cronbach's alpha for each task was moderate to strong, suggesting connected speech could hold its own in terms of internal consistency. This is supported by the way that the vowel pairs mirrored each other, with the exception, of course, of directions, 
where there are relatively few minimally paired streets for the e e vowel pair. Next, we'll check the means for each task. For identification, I expected that with each step of added complexity, we would see a decrease in scores. So participants would perform better on isolated speech prompts than with connected speech prompts. And syntactically predictable directions tasks would yield higher scores than diverse sentences tasks. Results generally supported this hypothesis. BVLT boasted the highest scores where the more diverse tasks were lower. Breaking things down into syllables, participants performed between 7 and 10% better with monosyllabic words than with disyllabic words. And of course, we looked at BBT as a predictor. Results from the mixed model analysis suggested that BVT was not at all a good predictor of performance with sentences. It was statistically significant, but negligible. Now, what are the takeaways? Well, B vowel T and sentence prompts both yield acceptably strong internal cons consistency. There appeared to be some score inflation with B vowel T, where those prompts tended to be easier than the more diverse prompt types. BBT was a significant but negligible predictor. Diverse words was better. We also found that by incorporating variability, we're able to adjust difficulty. Monosyllabic words, for instance, are easier than disyllabic, and isolated words are easier than connected speech sentences. This can inform test and training designs, but there are certain limitations to be aware of. Participants were cued by buttons, so they could listen strictly for target words. It would perform similarly to words in isolation. Features of connected speech like phonological diversity, sentence stress, and varied vowel duration were still a factor, but after study one, we still didn't know how participants would perform based strictly on oral cues. Further, the 50-50 chance of a correct answer was likely an inflator of scores. Lastly, item analysis showed that there were often certain words in each pair that were more difficult than the other and this reflected higher discrimination scores. It was hypothesized that familiarity, or more accurately in the case of sentences, association, would have an indirect relationship with discrimination. With this in mind, a second experiment was designed to eliminate cues and measure the effect of association with performance. So let's find out what happens when we control for these limitations. So experiment one provided a step toward understanding how participants might perform in connected speech contexts, but essentially it fixed participants with auditory training wheels. By providing labeled buttons, participants were directed toward the target words, cueing their attention and allowing them to ignore the meaning of each sentence. Experiment two removed those training wheels by incorporating transcription and explicitly measuring the participants' associations of target words with sentences that they were heard in. We also directly measured participants' familiarity with the target words, employing a post-test word knowledge survey. The aim of study two was to further explore the extent to which sentences could provide viable testing materials. The primary research question was to what extent does association impact perception in sentential contexts? Study two included 33 Mandarin L1 speakers and seven control. The goal was to recruit at least 40 participants for each group. However, COVID struck and, well, changed things. The Mandarin group was an advanced cohort of English language speakers with an average IELTS score of 7.3 overall and 7.8 for listening. The listening component of the experiment consisted of five randomly ordered tasks. The baseline comparison was B vowel T discrimination and identification tasks. For discrimination, an oddity task was used, so listeners would hear three words and decide which word was the different word. For example, B, B, boot, where the third word is the odd one out. Participants had the option on selecting same if all the words sounded the same. 
25% of the trials of the trials rather were same. The B vowel T identification was a transcription task where participants heard a single B vowel T word and wrote what they heard. The travel agent task was a predictable task with predictable syntax. Participants were asked where the speaker wanted to book a room and listened for the location. This location was always at the end of the carrier sentence. Because of this uniformity and the ability to listen for a specific word, the travel agent task was expected to, ask, to act as a bridge between isolated words and connected speech. Question and answer drew participants' attention to specific information to listen for in the sentence, but unlike travel agent, the information could be sentence initial, medial, or final. And finally, diverse sentences took things a bit further by simply asking participants to type what they heard. The target word could be anywhere in the sentence and no question directed their focus. After the listening tasks were completed, participants were asked to complete an association task and a word knowledge task. For the association task, using a slider, participants identified which word in the minimal pair that they associated with the sentence. For the word knowledge task, participants indicated the extent of their knowledge for each target word, ranging from one to five. One indicated that the per participant had no recollection of hearing the word and didn't know what it meant, while five indicated that the participant had heard the word, knew what it meant, and could use it in a sentence. Each participant's results for the target word association task and word knowledge task were mapped to their performance using, using generalized linear mix modeling. Several analyses were done for this experiment, but in the interest of time, only a selection will be covered. For time, only the front mid-low vowel pairs will be reported here, but results were mirrored in the high vowel pair. If you're interested in additional measures and results from this experiment, please feel free to contact me. Looking at the mean scores for each prompt type, we can see a clear drop-off in connected speech tasks, far more so than in experiment one, which used closed-ended prompts. Now let's look at how association impacted scores. There were three kinds of association identified in this study, same, opposite, and equal. And I'll just take a moment to explain what those are. There are two words in each minimal pair and a single sentence that they're heard in. Both words are possible and reasonable for the sentence context. The participant could associate the target word with the sentence it's played in, so that's same association. They could associate the other word in the minimal pair with the sentence, that's opposite, or the participant could associate both words equally with the sentence context, so that's equal. It appears that Mandarin speakers are generally getting the distinction in the high vowel pair, and you can see this with how they perform with same and equal associations. However, when you look at the opposite, we see something quite interesting there appears to be a kind of interaction between top-down and bottom-up processing. Simply, these advanced learners seem to be heavily dominated by top-down processing. While perception is intact, this dominance is evidenced by the drop from a near-pass level, 79%, to approximately half of that, 40%. True perceptual acuity, displayed by higher performers in the L2 group and in the control, appears robust to top-down processes, so we don't see this distinction. Here are the results from the mixed model analysis. I'm going to go ahead and skip these. Okay, so overall takeaways. Sentences compare favorably to BVT for prompt design. Sentence prompts, particularly diverse sentence prompts, have strong internal consistency and match predictions as well or better than BVT. More diverse prompt types do make things more difficult, but that's not necessarily bad. I would argue that such complexity is construct relevant. BVT tends to inflate scores. Further, complexity allows us to systematically toggle difficulty. 
For instance, more syllables are more challenging and connected speech is more difficult than isolated speech. Returning to the question of whether the results we get from isolated prompts generalize beyond isolated contexts, they don't seem to. BVT does not predict performance with sentences very well. For associations, by checking for which word of a minimal pair participants associate with sentences, we see two very neat things. One, we can toggle difficulty, and two, we can explore the interaction between bottom-up and top-down processes. And as a bonus, transcription as a response type works great for advanced learners. Thanks for watching this presentation. Keep healthy and well, and please feel free to contact me either via email or LinkedIn at the addresses provided.